All right, good evening. Good to see you this evening. It's a beautiful day the Lord gave us. Hope you had a good time this afternoon. Uh, my family's home, the, the Mother's Day meal didn't agree with them, so they're, they're at home watching online today. So for Mother's Day, that's what they got. But uh, no, they're, they're doing all right, though. They'll be, they'll be right as rain tomorrow, I'm sure. So let's start by going to page 612 for those that are here. If you're watching at home, the song is He Keeps Me Singing. You can look it up and sing along with us, page 612. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low, still I lie and with thee, peace be still, in the love life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I knew, fill my every Keep me singing as I do. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. This nor filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken string, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I knew, filled my every longing, keeps me singing as I go, feasting on the riches of his grace, resting neath the children. Wing, always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing. <laughs> Jesus, 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 sweetest name I knew. 
Sunday nights, you're lucky sometimes I remember to say things I forget to say on Sunday mornings. But I was going to mention this this morning that recently we passed one year being on the radio. Uh, so thank you for those who give uh, to that. Uh, that's something that's separate from the rest of the church budget and people just individually give towards that. And it's a blessing because that also provides not just the radio there in Butler, but uh, the uh, online uh, ministry that we're part of that. Uh, is a monthly charge, and, and through that, I was just checking uh, before coming up here so I could tell you, um, through that ministry, we've reached 59 different nations, and uh, all 50 states, so so that's a blessing. So the radio ministry money, it's not just going to Butler County, it's uh, going all over the place. So thank you for those that give to that, that's a little report for you. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to try and tally up as best I can through all the different online medias that we have, how many nations we've reached and different things like that. But that is a hard number to find. That's not as easy as you'd think. But uh, the Lord has blessed in that regard. And uh, we've gotten a couple of different emails and things from people from different places that have been watching different services. And so that's a blessing. Uh, modern technology can definitely be a horrifying thing, uh, but it can also be used for the good of the Lord. So thank you for those that give to the radio ministry. It is being used uh, well for the ministry. And then also some of the announcements, just reminders. Uh, Sunday the 22nd uh, in the evening service, we have the missionary going to the Middle East. We will not be live streaming or recording that service in any way. And so I'd encourage you to make plans to be with us that evening uh, to meet that missionary family and hear what they have to say. And then the uh, Bible project we have, I don't know how much has come in yet today. We don't count in the morning, but uh, we do know that over, over 4,000 have been raised as of um, last week. Over 4,000 have been raised of the 5,000 needed of, for that Bible project. So thank you for those who have given and those who have prayed. It does not, uh, it, it's no difference to me whether you give financially or pray because the praying helps the giving. 
Uh, you may not have a penny to your name to give, and that is fine. But if you pray for it, then somebody who does may be felt the touch of the Lord to, to give. And so I think the prayers are just as important, if not more important. And so never feel like never feel like you're left out if you can't give. Uh, I understand that completely. When we when Michelle and I got married, we were we were renting a place for 750 a month, and my year's salary was about 12 grand. And so you can do the math there. There wasn't a whole lot of money to be giving. So I know what it feels like to not be able to give much to special things, but the prayers are so important. So thank you for praying for that. Please continue to do so. And then uh, keep in mind that that first, it'll probably be the first big outreach of this year uh, since we've had this project kind of taken some of our focus away from those ministries and those things just purely because of time involved. Uh, July 2nd, the Independence Day street fair and everything. Uh, we'll be out there giving out tracks, and we'll have the booth set up, and Lord willing, we'll be passing out free cotton candy and everything and trying to make connections. And then we've got, towards the end of July, of course, we've got the uh, last week of July, first week of August, will be the Vacation Bible School this year. Neighborhood Bible Time's coming this year to help with that, and so it'll be, it'll be a good time. It'll be a good opportunity for people to serve and a good opportunity to let people know about the church and about the Lord. So be praying about those things if you would, and keep in mind that concert, May 27th. May 27th at 7 p.m. here at the church. If you've never been to one of the Down East Boy concerts, I'd encourage you to come. It's a great uh, blessing and encouraging time. And so please make plans to be there for that. All right, that's all the announcements that I believe I had. But before we, well, I'll, I'll read our missionary letter before I preach tonight. We got a new missionary letter from the Hollands today. And so I think we'll go ahead and just uh, read that this evening before I preach. So we'll go to Go to our greeting hymn, page 534, The Longer I Serve Him. The Longer I Serve Him. Page 534. Let's stand together as we sing this evening. Shall we stand, 534, The longer I serve Him, the sweeter He grows.
let's sing that again. Great song. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he can prove, since I gave my heart to Jesus, saints around here, and I know you've been saved a long time, and we're singing this song, The Longer I Serve Him, The Longer I Serve Him, The Sweeter It Grows. Could you give a testimony? Yes, we do. Down bottom. Yep. Amen. Long time ago. <laughs> True. Well, <laughs> one of these days we'll be in heaven. No more aches, no more pains. That's what we got to look forward to. That's where we're going forward. Well, that's why we come to church, to keep learning from the Word. Because there's plenty of things that we don't know. You know, we, we, we take it for what, what we believe that it says. Yep. Oh, you will. I believe we'll, I believe we'll know each other as we're known. Oh, yeah. 
I do believe. That's my faith. I don't know what preacher's speaking. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, a sermon on heaven's coming up. He's going to explain a lot of the stuff that the good book tells us. But uh, I was just thinking that because, you know, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. I know you've been serving the Lord a long time. We remember when you served the Lord with your wife by your side here at the church. And, uh, you know, I was just thinking of all that today, you know, and we you sing. Oh, yes. Yes. Penbrook Road, yeah. Somebody out, somebody in this church owned a swimming pool off of that road. Yeah. And that's where I was baptized. Yeah. That's yep. where Christian baptized the little children. Yeah. Well, we've been around that. <laughs> Baptismals in a pond, baptismals yeah. in a creek. That shows one thing, we're old. <laughs> but now they have a nice baptistry, it's all warm and everything. Okay, I just want to get your... Uh, testimony there when we're singing such a great song. Brother Pete, you want to receive the offering here? And I'll give thanks for the offering. Thank you, Lord, again for your blessings to us. And Lord, truly, we do look forward to heaven. And Lord, we have aches, pains, troubles, and all the things that these songs talk about. Lord, and uh, one day they'll be uh, gone forever. We'll have no more pain, no more sickness. Lord, it will be just a wonderful occasion. We'll be gathered around the throne, praising you. We'll know as we are known. Lord, uh, looking forward to seeing uh, our relatives, our friends. Uh, thinking today of mothers, thinking of seeing our mothers who have helped us, many of us, helped us along through life. Lord, precious memories of folks who have gone on. Lord, we thank you for the Folks have stood by the stuff all these years, and here we are, Lord. Now we're on the piers of, as they say, looking across the river, so as to speak. Lord, it's about our time to cross coming up, many of those senior saints. And Lord, we're looking across the river, and we think of those who've gone on before. And Lord, may we leave behind what they left behind for us. Good testimonies, good, uh, good works of uh, ministry, Lord, toward helping the cause of Christ. Thank you for it all, Lord, and bless this offering that we're about to give to help continue uh, the cause of Christ being promoted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Christ, another good song. Number 627, we'll just sing the first and last verse of 627, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Oh, how I 
Let's uh, go ahead and get this update from our missionary before we dive into our Bibles tonight. I'll do my best. Uh, I've been trying not to get behind on things with work with the work out there, but uh, the missions display board needs some updating, so I'll do my best to get these updates out there. Uh, but for now, we'll just read it to you. This is the update from the Holland family in Norway. You'll remember that uh, shortly before we got uh, flooded out of that room over there, we had a uh, virtual update from them in person, uh, live over the internet uh, a while back, just before Josiah was born, and I believe they were the first one that we tried that with, so I was thankful that he was willing to do that, but this is their update right now. It says, hello, Alan Saman, which maybe that's how you say that, maybe it's not, but I'm reading it, so that's how it said. Uh, we, we trust this letter finds you encouraged and looking for our Lord's return. We have been blessed in the last few months to grow in some of our relationships here. We were Happy on Easter to be able to host some people from the church for supper and enjoy some sweet fellowship around the resurrection of our Lord. It is always a wonderful thing to reflect upon the sacrifice and power of our great Savior. Additionally, we have met some others who have graciously invited us into their homes. This has allowed us to learn more about Norwegian culture and thinking. Part of the ministry uh, task is learning about the hearts of a people so that we might effectively communicate the truth of the gospel with them. Please pray God would continue to open these doors for us and that through these uh, relationships he would build his church. We have enjoyed the sunshine the last two months and the lengthening days. Spring seems to be the prettiest season in Norway by far. These added uh, utility for outreach efforts is a huge benefit of the nice weather. Please pray for our efforts as we sow the gospel seed. On May 17th, we will have Norway's birthday celebration. This is a big deal every year and a prime opportunity for us to spread the good news. Please pray that God would soften hearts and direct people to salvation. Please continue to pray for our language learning. We are progressing and are now able to have very short, simple conversations as we are out and about. However, much learning is still required, and we thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your faithful support and prayers. We are encouraged and blessed to know that so many are lifting up our needs before God. Um, for requests are required, continued progress in, prayer, in uh, language learning, sowing and watering of the gospel seed, and for visitors. Um, there's a couple of different uh, things that they include in here as well. Uh, the praises being good, good weather and for outreach and language learning pro uh, progress. Uh, that seems to be a, a theme of the most recent prayer letters of several of our missionaries is language learning. Uh, we're blessed in that several of our missionaries are, are new to the field, even this family. I believe they've been on the field less than a year. And uh, we've got the, uh, uh, the Hazel Swartz that just got to the field this year, the, the Caden Heads that just got to the field this year, the, uh, the oh, now it's killing me, uh, in the nation I'm not supposed to say, the girlies that got to the, got to the field this year. And so a lot of, lot of missionaries having the same kind of struggles, you know, language learning and things like that. Um, and it's, it's amazing to me sometimes to see he, what he mentioned in there about part of witnessing to people and winning people is learning their hearts so that you can witness to them. And I've read enough missionary biographies to know that that is the case. You've got to learn the people and, and, and do that to some degree before you can reach them effectively. And so we, we read some update letters like, like from Brother Rischel where there are multiple churches being started all at one time. There's people getting saved and baptized, it seems, every time there's a letter. 
And then there's others that they're just getting off the ground. They barely know the language and they're doing everything they can and there's just no fruit yet. And, uh, and both are equally uh, impressive to me because it's one thing to serve when there's all kinds of fruit and it's another thing to serve when you haven't seen a single salvation yet. And uh, there's challenges to both. There's blessings to both. So keep our missionaries in your prayers. It, it just shows you there's different, fer- uh, there's different amounts of fertility in the fields out there in the world. Uh, some fields are ready to harvest. Some fields are like America and getting pretty hard to till, pretty hard to water and, and see fruit from. Uh, but we're glad we have missionaries in several different fields. Looking forward to adding a missionary this year. We had allotted for that in the budget. And uh, I don't know if it'll be the next missionary we have in or not, but we'll find out. And I'm looking forward to uh, to continuing on in the ministry that God has given us to reach the world. All right, so that's the update from them. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 3 in our Bibles. Exodus chapter number 3. Now we're going to answer a couple of questions today that if you've been with us since I've been here, you may remember us answering in the past uh, during the Genesis study uh, for one of them and during just a random sermon for another, but it's been over a year since either have been addressed and they're addressed here in this passage. So we're going to look at them again tonight, and then we're going to uh, wrap up with something something new from the Word of God here, and uh, hope it'll be a blessing and help to you. Uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your Word. Help us as we once again turn to its pages to learn uh, what we need to know for our lives, Lord, what we need to understand for our testimonies and for how we ought to live. Lord, help us to understand these things and to be blessed by them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Exodus chapter number 3. And uh, this morning, of course, we looked at primarily the burning bush. We looked at it from that perspective of being a burning bush for the Lord, being that unique thing that God is in that people turn aside to see and that leads them to Christ. Uh, and I hope that that analogy landed for everybody. hope everybody understood that, um, but, uh, and that and that we'll try to be that for the people around us in the world. Uh, we're going to look at it a different way this morning or this evening. We're going to look at just some kind of some questions that arise from the text. Exodus chapter 3, verse number 1, the Bible says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him, out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. Now, the question I want to address first and foremost is one that uh, a lot of people, uh, a surprising number of people that I've met, have a pretty strong opinion about, which I really don't, other than, you know, my favorite preacher preached it that way, and I don't want to think that he was wrong, I don't know why there'd be a real strong opinion either way about this topic, but the question is, who is the angel of the Lord? And, uh, and I've been asked this before, and, and I've, I've come across my Bible reading. I've, I've run into some questions about, well, this doesn't really, eh, this, I, don't, I don't know how to rectify this. And so uh, long ago, studied out the, the idea, the question, the thought, who is the angel of the Lord? And so, Lord willing, that's going to be the first thing that we tackle this evening. The angel of the Lord, sometimes uh, I've heard it said that uh, every time you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, that that's Jesus Christ before uh, his coming to earth in bodily form. And, uh, and I understand why people say that. And, and honestly, I think it's just easier to say that. And so people just, you know, instead of studying out every single time it's, it's found. Um, but I just, I don't believe that that is so. I think that there are some instances where that is definitely the case, where it's very clear that that is Jesus Christ before uh, his uh, coming to the earth in bodily form, uh, showing up in scripture. I believe that's absolutely the case in some places, uh, places like uh, where Daniel and Meshach and or Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego are in the fiery furnace, and the fourth one, like the Son of God, I believe that's the Lord. And uh, so there's different places where the Lord does appear, but to take the title of Angel of the Lord and apply it to the Lord specifically and and in every place, every case, I think is not correct. And I'll show you why. So let's get some examples here. In Judges chapter six. Hold your place in Exodus with me. Uh, Judges chapter six. And if you've learned differently, that's fine. It just you know, just hear the evidence that I present from the Bible and make up your own mind. I'm not going to be hurt either way. 
Judges chapter 6 and verse number 12. The Bible says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Uh, and so we, we see this um, we see this happening in, in chapter 6 and verse 12 and verse number 24. The Bible says, Then Gideon built an altar there. Oh, I'm sorry, what, verse number 22. Uh, verse number 22, 12 and 22. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. So Gideon here gives us a couple of clues in this, in this question. Uh, one of the clues I, I think is the, word, the way that he says, I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. Now, if I say I have seen an fan of the Pittsburgh Penguins or whatever, then you would assume there's more than one of those things because I said I saw an fan of that. The Greek grammar is terrible. I get that. I don't know how to fix that, but... An angel means there's more than one angel, right? If I've seen an, again, it just wording sounds terrible, an plant, I know there's one more than one plant because of the an. That's the way English works, even though I clearly don't know how to speak it. Um, that's the way it works. And so when it says there's that he's seen an angel of the Lord, I think that that implies that there's more than one angel of the Lord. Uh, and I'm not saying there's more than one Christ. I'm saying there's more than one angel of the Lord. Uh, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13. Let's go to this one. Matthew 2, 13. Now this is one where uh, some people do hold the concept that every single time the phrase is used, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that's just, whether it's intentional or not, that's just lazy. Uh, because Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 13, the Bible says, and when they were departed, talking about the uh, wise men that, that went a different way out of the country after seeing the Lord. When they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to, appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Well, who's the young child? It's Jesus Christ. And so the young child, Jesus Christ, he's already there manifesting a body of flesh, and now the angel of the Lord is talking to Joseph in a dream. And so I, I've met people that think, well, yeah, that's that's him. I'm like, well, he's already there. And so to me, that doesn't that doesn't fit. Um, Christ already present on the earth. The angel of the Lord speaking to Joseph um, in in Exodus chapter three and verses two through four. What we read in the beginning, many are people are convinced because of the wording that it's Christ who called Moses from the bush. But I want to look at that again. I want you to read it carefully with me and see what all we all, what all we see in these four verses. Or in, sorry, let's start in verse two. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. So first we have an, an, uh, the angel of the Lord appearing to him from, from within the bush. Now, verse number four, and when the Lord, not the angel of the Lord, when the Lord, capital L, saw that he turned aside to see, God called. So we have angel of the Lord, Lord, and God all used to describe this situation and what's going on. Now, I've been told that those are just all different names and titles of the Lord. And I understand that. I get that perspective. I just think there might be a party going on in the bush. Uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, There's, I, I get that. The Lord could be the Lord Jesus Christ. God could be God the Father calling out from the bush. We know God the Father is the one that primarily does the speaking in the Old Testament. And then uh, you, the angel of the Lord could be exactly what that, what that is intended to say. An angel of the Lord uh, caused the fire in the bush, got the attention of Moses, and then the Lord himself took it from there. So again, whatever you want to believe about that, that's fine. It ain't going to hurt my feelings. But if you turn with me to Acts chapter 7, in our reaccounting of this story from the martyr Stephen before he dies, uh, if you remember, we, we talked about the bush being... Uh, being uh, recalled by two people in Scripture, Jesus Christ and Stephen. Here, when Stephen talks about the bush, he also mentions uh, something important to what we're talking about here. Verse 30, And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. And when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. So here we see an angel of the Lord getting Moses' attention and then God the Father speaking to Moses from the bush. 
And so if it's an angel of the Lord, that means there's more than one. And if it's an angel of the Lord, then it can't be Jesus Christ because there's only one of him. So to me, that makes sense. To you, that might not. I understand. Uh, but I, I don't think that we can say uh, that the angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ in every time that we find it. Now, there's there's dozens of places you find angel of the Lord, uh, the angel Lord and angel of the Lord uh, all throughout the scripture. But I think this is my Pastor Jeffism here. I believe the title of Angel of the Lord is just that. It's a title given to angels. Now, this is going to be deep. That serve the Lord. I, I am a... Uh, okay, I hate to use this phrase for myself because preachers misuse it all the time. I am a man of God because I belong to God and I serve God. And, and Brother Ken is a man of God. It's not a pastor's title to be man of God. I, I, people make that mistake all the time. Um, you are a woman of God if you belong to God and if you serve God. And so an angel of the Lord, I think, is a title for an angel that serves the Lord and belongs to the Lord. And so you say, aren't every angel an angel of the Lord? Well, not the devil. <laughs> he's an angel. He's a fallen angel. And so he's not an angel of the Lord. And, and who knows? Maybe there's some angels that are specifically servants to God the Father and maybe some that are specifically servants to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know. That's something we can ask him when we get there. But uh, I do know that the Bible says, and angel of the Lord many times. Uh, I believe there's more than one. Uh, so the title, I think, is just that. Sometimes angels are named, but most often we see the title. The most important part uh, of this whole point is that it doesn't really matter much either way. It isn't worth arguing about. It's just when preachers make the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ in every case in order to fit their sermons, they have a problem when they find that there's multiple angels of the Lord and that in many places it simply can't be Christ. And so that's that's the issue is when you're when you're trying to push a narrative so that it fits into your message or so that it's easier to study or easier to come to a conclusion, then you run into problems down the road when somebody comes and says, but why does it say an angel of the Lord doesn't mean, that mean there's more than one? Are there more than one Jesus is? And you, then you got to figure that out and talk to them and and then you feel silly. Um, so those who preach and teach must be careful not to stretch, stretch the scripture and make connections that sometimes aren't there just for effect. Uh, I have heard so many times, so many people make the statement that whenever you see angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, that's Jesus Christ. And I get it. And they probably fully believe that. They just probably haven't studied out every time you find the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. And it's much easier to just say that than to detail everyone that is and everyone that isn't. And so I, I get it, understand it, but it's not accurate. And so we want to be accurate with our conversation of the Scripture. We want to be accurate with what we teach and tell people. And so what I would say is there are plenty of instances in the Bible where, that, where I believe that absolutely is the Lord. And there are plenty of instances in the Bible where I believe that absolutely cannot be the Lord. And so you just got to study it for what it is. It's a title, and it is, uh, it is something that the Lord uh, is at some of these points that I believe and sometimes uh, definitely is not, like when the Lord is already there. Uh, born on the earth and the angel of the Lord comes to Joseph in a dream. So again, something that's interesting to me, maybe it's interesting to you and uh, something that, that I just want to be, want to try and clear some things up on. Cause I know a lot of people have asked that question of me over the years, who is the angel of the Lord? Uh, I think the angel of the Lord is the Lord uh, in many cases, but I think an angel of the Lord is exactly that an angel that attends in the Lord does the Lord's bidding. Now Exodus chapter three and verse number five, if we'll turn back there, um, it was hard to skip over this this morning because uh, I so badly wanted to hit this point. Um, but it is <laughs> it is a touchy subject nowadays, and it really shouldn't be. Um, you'll see in a moment. The Bible says, And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Now, we had a coffee shop at Bible College that was named Holy Grounds because play on words there. Uh, some people I know have, there's churches that have Hebrews in their, uh, in their church that serves coffee because, you know, he brews Hebrews. They think it's funny. I get it, whatever. But uh, you want coffee, get it before you come or whatever. I don't know. But what I'm saying is, holy ground, studying it out, that's the only time you find that phrase in the whole Bible. Holy ground. There's no other reference to holy ground in the Word of God other than right here. And so I'm not going to say when you walk into this church, you're walking on holy ground. There's plenty of churches that I've walked into that I guarantee you <laughs> that was not holy ground. <laughs> it was it was bad, bad ground, not a great place to be when it comes to doctrine or truth or 
Christianity as a whole. And so I, I'm not going to say, you know, every time you walk into church, you're walking on holy ground. Uh, I've, I've heard people make that claim. I've heard independent fundamental Baptist preachers thundering from the pulpit. You're here, you're on holy ground, and you got to I get that. I'm not going to stretch the Scripture too far because that's what I just preached against doing. But I am going to say that when coming into presence of God, God demanded some things of Moses. For Moses' own good, he said, you need to stop, don't come any closer until you take off your shoes because this is special holy ground. And I think it is a shameful thing that in our culture, you've got people coming to church in their PJs. Now, I get it. I understand. Again, human nature, everybody's like, oh, we just want them to come. I'd rather them come wearing whatever than not come at all. I get it. You, wor you worked all day. You look nasty. You might leave a stain on the pew. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Glad you're here. I'd rather you come here than go home and say, well, I don't have time to get changed and go to church. Come straight from work. That'd be great. But don't come straight from bed looking like bed. I mean, come on. Is it that hard? Is it really asking that much? to not wear pajamas in church. Now, thankfully, I don't think I've seen that here. My dad one time, they were, they were church shopping a little bit at one point. He said he went into a church and he said everybody there, he said probably 80% were like in their jammies. He said they were, they were grossly overweight, like all of them. And they were all in like sweatpants and like pajama clothes. And he said some of them were even in like slippers and stuff. He said he couldn't believe it. And he said that poor preacher was the only one that looked like he was in church. And, and I was like, I, I was laughing at him. I was like, what did you guys do? He's like, we left. <laughs> it's like, it's so weird. And, um, and so I, I get it. You know, not everybody wears a suit and tie, and that's fine. Not everybody wears, you know, the, the pretty dresses or whatever. That's fine. I'm not saying what you have to wear or don't have to wear to church. I'm just saying it should be a special place. Uh, when, you, when you're trying to meet with God, when the intention is to meet with the creator of the universe, I don't think it's too high of a standard to set to say, put whatever is nicest that you own on. Because you're meeting with God. If you were going to meet with anybody important in today's day and age, if you, you, know, if you were going to meet with the president, whoever you think that is, you'd probably dress up. I would assume if you have any kind of self-respect, you would want to look your best if you meet somebody of that stature. But yet when we go to meet God, we're like, oh, don't judge me. Don't have those standards. You, you preachers and your standards. And people get all mad at me for expecting them to come to church in clothes. Pajamas are clothes, yes, but you know, not the right type. Come on. So anyways, that's the holy ground. You can see why people have an issue with that nowadays. It's, it's ridiculous. The fact that that is even a a problem shows how lazy our culture is and how little they esteem God. So that's really what it is. They don't come to church expecting to meet with God because if you come to a place expecting to meet with God, it sounds terrible. I know I'm parroting some, some old-fashioned preacher, but you dress for the occasion. Um, and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Now, if, if you come in here, if somebody comes in here, especially a visitor comes in here, as um, long as their dress is not grossly inappropriate, we're happy they're here. I will not say a word to them about how they're dressed. And I know some of the reason people have such an issue with this topic is because there's been preachers in the past that when the kids get off the bus, they make them go change into different clothes to come into church and all that. And I think that's ridiculous. I understand why so many people are so against having any kind of standards because people have taken it too far in the past. But all I'll say here is whether or not you consider the church to be holy ground, if you come here expecting to meet with God, act like you're expecting to meet with God. And that, that comes to your dress. That comes to what we're going to talk about in a moment as well. Not just the way you are dressed when, when God said, take off your shoes off your feet. This is holy ground. But in, in Moses' response to that, we see also another thing that you ought to do when you come to church expecting to meet with God. You ought to have sen a sense of the fear of God. You see, verse 5, we read verse 5, and he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, some of you may remember, we talked about the fear of God in the past year. And, and it may be memorable because it's one of the very, very, very rare times that I read a Greek or Hebrew word to you. And I'll explain why, for those who have forgotten, the fear of God is something that is commanded to us. 
Turn two places in your Bible, Ecclesiastes 12 and 2 Corinthians 7. Ecclesiastes 12 and 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. I am, I don't know the proper terminology. I don't want to say something and be, be labeled something that I didn't even know what it was, but I believe in the King James Bible. I believe that's all you need because God gave us His perfect book. And I don't think God is limited by languages because He made them. And we could get into more detail about that. We've done that several times in the past. We won't bother doing that tonight. You can believe different if you want, but I'll just choose to believe the Lord. <laughs> and so Ecclesiastes 12, and uh, which is evading me for some reason, and uh, then... 2 Corinthians chapter 7. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse number 13, this is one of my one of my favorite verses in all the Bible because I like summaries. I like wrapping it all up and neat in a bow. And at the end of all of Proverbs and all of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, the wisest man to ever live according to God, says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's, that's what he said. He said, fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. This is the conclusion of the whole matter. If you wrap up everything I've ever learned, this is it. I think that's, I think that's important to understand and to know. 2 Corinthians 7, verse number 1. The Bible says here, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, I do not believe that it is necessary to turn to the Greek and Hebrew and understand God's Word, but sometimes we grow up hearing something that is not completely accurate, and in order to undo a wrong or an incomplete understanding of something, we can look back to that and understand that, hey, we forgot English. And so looking back to the Greek and Hebrew might remind us of that. Now again, not necessary, but sometimes helpful. Uh, this is an example of such a case. If you had never been told, well, let's do it this way. How many of you have been told at some point in your life, whether by a preacher or somebody else, that when you see in the Bible the fear of God or fearing the Lord, it means reverence or respect? Anybody ever been told that? Nobody. All right. Or your hands don't work. I see a lot of little nods like I'm not, I'm not going to completely admit to this. Okay. I think most people have heard that. Uh, even though that went over like a lead brick. I think most people have heard that. I know I heard that many times in my life. And, and it's not entirely untrue. But again, it's just like with the angel of the Lord. Sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not. You just have to dig a little deeper and understand what we see in the Word of God. Again, just like with so many other words in the Bible, you think heaven. There's multiple heavens in the Bible. And the context tells us which heaven is the heaven that we're talking about. The heaven where God lives, the heavens where the bird flies. Or, or the heaven, the air we breathe, the heaven that's to come. There's lots of different heavens. There's different words for wine in the Bible. And there's the wine that is essentially what we would call grape juice. There's the wine that has been turned colored, turned red in the cup. And that's the, that's the alcoholic stuff. And there's different words for that in the Bible. And we don't need a Greek or Hebrew word to find that and figure it out. We just need to read the context and know, okay, this clearly is against drinking wine. So it must mean the alcoholic wine, not the grape juice wine. So it doesn't take much to figure it out without going to the Greek and Hebrew. But here we see in the word fear, uh, we understand the fear means to be made afraid. That's the most common understanding of the word fear. It's not respect, because if I say I'm afraid of spiders, it doesn't mean I respect sp spiders. We, we know fear, as it's used most in the English language, means to be made afraid. Uh, but when it comes to the Bible, we don't like the idea of fearing God or being made afraid of God. And so we turn it to respecting and, and all that. And I get that. And sometimes that's accurate. Uh, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. I will, I'll give you some information here that might help clarify what I'm going at. Um, in Ecclesiastes, what we read in Ecclesiastes, the word, the word fear is the Hebrew word yare, which means to revere but also means fright or dread. So it's one of those words, of course, uh, most words you look up in the dictionary, there's a primary definition, there's a secondary definition, sometimes there's a tertiary definition, and all beyond that. And so the Hebrew word yare, which is found in Ecclesiastes, where it says, fear God and keep His commandments is the whole duty of man, the primary definition of that word is to revere. 
So that's exactly what we would expect uh, when, from what we've mostly, uh, at least from what I've mostly been told about uh, understanding uh, uh, the fear of the Lord. Now, fear in 2 Corinthians is the Greek word phobos, which means to be put in fear, alarm, or fright. So when the Bible says perfecting holiness in the fear of God, that's not referencing the reverence of God, but an actual fear of God. Now, before you get too concerned about that, we'll, we'll explain it in just a moment, what I believe it means uh, to fear God. Um, in all verses and uses of the word fear of the Bible, there, there's, there's a difference in, in what that fear is. God chooses chastisement as an example of his relationship with us in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 12. We'll go ahead and read a few verses here and understand how this works. Hebrews 12, verse number 6, the Bible says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, if you are being chastened and scourged by someone, usually that would cause you to have a, a fear of them, or at least a healthy fear of them, or at least of the scourge, or of the chastening. Verse 7, If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons? Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather than be in subjection to the Father of spirits and to live? Now, again, reverence is brought into play here. So what I think about all this is that there is a fear of God that is not just respect, it is a fear that you have of your father who is going to punish you for doing wrong. It's not just that you respect your dad, it's that you fear your dad. Because your dad has the power to set you straight. And your dad has the ability to set you straight. And maybe it was your mom, I get it, you know, gender roles, blah, blah, blah. Your parent, or whoever it was in your life, had that paddle or had that belt or had that firm hand, and you had fear of that, and that fear, the Bible calls it the beginning of, of knowledge. And, and that is essentially how God inst instructs us to raise our children with the rod because we put the fear of God into them so that the police don't have to do it when they grow up. And so we see this fear of God question. Moses was afraid to look upon God. It wasn't, you know, oh, I'm, I'm reverencing you by not looking on you. It was a fear of God because this is God speaking to you in person. Now, we love the idea of God speaking to us, right? Because we have the New Testament version of God speaking to us through the Holy Spirit, which is within us, and through His, His Word, which we read. Not God speaking to us from heaven, which is the Old Testament means of God speaking to people, and often included thunderings and, and all this stuff. And it was, you know, it was quite a thing. You, you read about people that met face to face with God in the, in the Bible. They did not say, oh, wow, looks, that's amazing. They hid themselves. They hid themselves. Even Adam and Eve in the garden, once they had sinned, they fled and hid away. And so it's, it's, I think that when it comes to fearing God, we, we do ourselves a disservice by just automatically assuming that every time we see the word, it means to reverence God, because I think we need, especially in America, we need a true fear of God again, where we have some fear of this God is my father, and if I do wrong, he's going to chastise me for it because he loves me. It's not that I'm afraid that he's going to strike me with lightning dead because I messed something up. It's that I have a, 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 a healthy fear of that authority over my life. And I think there's another way you can take it and understand it too, is, is to fear disappointing God more than being embarrassed in front of people, to fear breaking God's law more than being called a bigot by sinful men, to fear uh, finding yourself against God on an issue more than to fear having the majority, the minority opinion. I think a lot of people, their fear is of other things, and if they had a fear of God, or at least in the sense of fear of disappointing God, fear of being against God, fear of taking the wrong avenue away from God, then that would definitely... Uh, be, make them far better off in their Christian lives than if they feared public opinion or if they feared, you know, the, the court of public opinion or they feared the, the response of people or whatever. Because that's what keeps people from witnessing the most, I think. It's just a fear that, well, what are they going to say? Well, aren't you more afraid? What is God going to think? I mean, come on. Are we more afraid of what some person is going to say if we say, hey, do you know about Jesus Christ? Or are we more afraid that God is going to see us refuse to open our mouths and, and be disappointed? And so I think the fear of God is more complex than just saying, 
fear and anger and, and all this, you know, this danger that comes with it or fear and reverence. I think it's more complex than that. And again, it's one of those things where you just you understand the context of the passage and you take it and you read it and you let the Holy Ghost guide you. Now, if you turn back to Exodus chapter three, we have one more thing, one more thing to look at here. Um, Exodus three and first Timothy one. Exodus three and first Timothy one. Just trying to answer some questions from the scripture this morning, this evening. And so we've got the, the, the angel of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. Hopefully that was beneficial and not made you even more confused than you were when we came in. Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 4. I'm going to read, we'll read together a, a passage here, a few verses. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where on thy standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land uh, out of that land, unto a good land, and a large, and a, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen in the, oppre uh, the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I, that I should go unto Pharaoh? and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now, first we see him saying, here I am. The Lord says, Moses, he says, here I am. And then the Lord tells him what he wants him to do, and he says, who am I? Now, this is reminiscent of Psalm 8.4 and Psalm 144.3, where the Bible says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? What is man that thou visitest him or that thou thinkest upon him? And, and I, get, I understand, I think it's a good thing, it's a very good thing always to have humility to say, Lord, who am I that you would allow me to be a witness? Who, would I, who am I that you would allow me to be saved? Who am I that you would do anything for me? I think that's always good. But I don't think it's humility that drives the, 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 I, the response here from Moses of who am I to go and, and talk to the people of Israel. Uh, if you, if you continue reading, which for time's sake we won't read it all, but chapter 3, verses 12 through 22, the Lord answers his question of who am I, and he goes on and he tells him again what he's going to have him do. And Moses says, well, who, who am I going to say sent me? And he says, tell him the I am has sent, that I am has sent you. And we'll talk about that next time we're together, Lord, Lord willing. And he continues on and he uses so, several definitive statements. We come down to verse 22, or I'm sorry, verse... Um, Verse 18, And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and, thou sh and she shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, now let us go, be we beseech thee three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when you go, you shall not go out empty. So the Lord says, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go, you're going to gather the people, you're going to tell them I'm, I've sent you, you're going to be confident, and you're going you're to go to the king of Egypt, you're going to the Pharaoh, and you're going to say, let my people go. And then he's, gonna, he's not going to let it happen, I'm going to perform these wonders, and then he's going to release you, and you're going to go out of there, rich and wealthy, if you read the next verse, you're going to borrow of the Egyptians all this stuff, and you're coming to come out, uh, and, and you're going to come worship me in this mountain. God tells him all these things as fact. But what Moses says in verse 1 of chapter 4 tells us that it wasn't humility that said, Who am I? He says, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. I don't think it's humility that's driving the question, Who am I to do this? I think it's hesitation. You read through this passage, and over and over again, Moses is asking questions. He's, he's making excuses. Lord, I can't speak. Even though we read earlier when we looked at Moses on the third or fourth lesson of the series, he's eloquent. 
He's, he's taught and learned, and he's a speaker. In the, Egypt, in the Egyptian culture, he understood all these things, and he was able to speak, and then he tells God, I, I can't speak. And God says, well, who made your mouth? Who made your tongue? And it just seems like God is, is just pulling his hair out, trying to get Moses to do what he said, even though, as we read before about Moses, way back when Moses killed the Egyptian, he knew that God wanted him to deliver Israel. And so somewhere between killing that Egyptian and 40 years later in the wilderness, he, he kind of lost that confidence. And now he says, here am I when God says his name, but when God says go, he says, who am I? And I think the better response is what we find in Isaiah 6, 8, of course. Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Not here am I, who am I? Not here am I, well, but what about my weakness? Here am I, what about my failures? Here am I, what about my past? Here am I, what about my inabilities? Just here am I, send me. Because God will enable you to do that which he has called you to do. I remember when I told the kids in Bible college that I was going to be a, a youth pastor. I was leaving school to go be a preacher. And, uh, and I remember them telling me that there was no way God could use me unless I had more degrees than the man before me. And I was like, well, you guys are messed up. And I, and I told them, I said, I, I don't need to be ready. Because they asked me, are you, you think you're ready to be that? You think you're ready to do that? I said, I don't need to be ready. God's ready. I just need to be willing. And he'll teach me. And boy, he has. Sometimes lessons were taught the hard way. Uh, but but I, that, I believe that's the case. I think that's how God works. He enables people to do the things he's called them to do. He's not going to call you to do something and then watch you struggle and say, ha ha, I didn't think you could do it. That's not what a loving father does. First Timothy chapter number one, verse 12. This will be the last, last verse we look at. The Bible says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for the economy faithful, putting me into the ministry. You know that word enabled? Uh, so often nowadays it's just used in a negative connotation. Don't be an enabler. Don't enable bad habits. Don't enable uh, your kids or whoever. Because that happens a lot. I understand that. But God is enabling Paul here. And the word enabled means supplied with sufficient power, physical, moral, or legal. And you think about if God is going to call me to something and enable me to do it, he is supplying me with sufficient power to do it. He is supplying the need for me to do what he's called me to do. Now, Paul, If Paul needed to be enabled by God, then surely we need to be enabled by God. And so for anybody to say, God's called me to do this and I'm ready, in and of yourself, no, you're not. <laughs> but by the help of God and the power of God, you will be. You will be, you can be. So I think it's important to understand and to see uh, this call of Moses is an amazing thing. Uh, but I would much rather... You know, if God calls me, calls to me in my life and tells me to do something, I'd much rather have the response that we see in Isaiah 6, 8. Here am I, send me. Because who am I is a legitimate question. But who I am doesn't matter when God is the one supplying the power. When God is the one working in my heart. And so I'd encourage you this evening to, to keep that thought in mind. Regardless of who you are, God is greater. And God will enable if God calls you to do something, tricks your heart about something, just trust Him and say, here am I, send me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this day. Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for examples we have. Lord, Moses, of course, is an amazing figure in Your Word and, and so often such a, such a blessing to see. Uh, Lord, we, we see, though, his hesitation here and we see, in contrast, Isaiah's, Lord, trust. Here am I, send me. And Lord, I pray you please help us to have that attitude. Help us to understand that you will enable us to do that which you have called us to do. Lord, it doesn't have to be a big ministry. It can be simply talking to somebody in the street, talking to a neighbor, whatever it might be. Lord, you, you call us to do something. You'll enable us. You'll give us the power to do it if we'll just trust you. Lord, help us to have that attitude and that spirit of trust. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Ken, what are we going to sing tonight? Page 558. Let's stand together. In our hymn books, we'll sing out 558 and use this time to pray if you'd like. 558, ready. Goes right along with the pastor's message. It's one that we don't sing very often. We're not super familiar with it. But... Verse 3. Ready to speak and ready to think, ready with heart and mind, ready 
to stand where he sees fit, ready his will to fly, ready to go and ready to stay, ready his place to fill, ready the servant, lowly or great, ready to do his will. Verse 4. Ready to speak and ready to warn, ready or soul to yearn, ready in life or ready in death, ready for his return, ready to go and ready to stay, ready my place to fill, ready for service. Lonely or great, ready to do His will. <laughs> Amen. And next time we'll be ready to sing that song. <laughs> but that's a blessing, though. You know, you, some churches you sing the same things all the time. I, it's a blessing that they'll they'll push the limits, and <laughs> we we like it. That's a good song. Yeah. We should probably learn it. <laughs> It'd be good. Ready to go and do His will. Ready to go. That's a great message. All right. Uh, Brother Pete, would you mind dismissing us in prayer? Please keep in mind and keep in prayer, of course, everything going on at the church. And uh, if you ever have a, a need, a prayer request or anything, please, please reach out. Brother Pete. Heavenly Father, I pray that you do make a way. I pray that you serve me here. I pray that you carry out. And we're so thankful.